Hello, my name is Jorb. I love gear, and this is my Korg Arbodicy. I am a little under the weather, I'm leaving the country in five days, and I wanted to sit down with something that I knew well enough to not have to do a bunch of research, it wouldn't be hard for me to talk about and still get excited about, but also something that I think is worth talking about. Not just, this will be easy for me, what's something I've been meaning to talk about that I think is really, really cool. I think there's a lot to talk about with the Korg Arpodacy reissues, why it was designed and worked the way it did, considering when it came out, plus we get to talk about the idea of a reissue. So if the Arp Odyssey is something that interests you, I encourage you to stick around. If you're subscribed and you're coming back, thanks for coming back. If you're a supporter on Patreon, thanks for doing that. If you want to support me uh, in another way, I have affiliate links. So if you ever use Reverb, Perfect Circuit, or Zounds, you can use my affiliate link and I'll get a kickback whenever you buy something. Okay, I'm done shilling. I want to talk about gear. <laughs> so where to begin? What is the Arp Odyssey? The Arp Odyssey originally came out in 1972, I think. And I'm pretty sure I remember this because the 2500 came out in 1970. 2600 came out in 1971, and the Arp Odyssey came out in 1972. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself and getting excited about the history of these things, but I think it's important to walk into an understanding of all of this by thinking about where it came from, right? So even just two years before this, synthesizers were all modular, and the Arp 2500 is interesting because it, it gets rid of jacks, physical jacks, in place of these sort of like notched faders, not a pin matrix, they're faders that slide into detents, and that's how you make connections. So it's a little more streamlined than having a bunch of patch cables. And then only a year after that, R puts out the 2600. Legendary is one step beyond the modular synthesizer. It's not modules that you individually change out. It's all modules that are packaged together, and there's a normal signal path. So it's a little closer to the fixed architecture synthesizers we're very familiar with now. And then we get the Arp Odyssey in 72, which is a self-contained keyboard attached all in one instrument for performers for musicians for the stage and to think about how close in time all these things were how rapidly this industry was changing it's so so exciting <laughs> arp of course had many other wonderful instruments come out alongside and after the odyssey if you're interested in those i'll point you to the inimitable alex ball for some more details i'm sure you already watch him <laughs> but there's your quick little history lesson arp puts out three synthesizers at this transitionary period away from modular and in three very different ways they are transitioning away from that and the arp odyssey i think is the most um is the most i don't know catapulted forward in time it sort of contextualized with the legend were two years past the minimog i think i think the minimog was 1970 but the odyssey to me represents more of that transition. I feel, in, in some ways, I feel more of the modular influence uh, in the Odyssey if compared to the Minimoog, some of the routings you can manipulate here, and I feel a little bit more of the future for, strangely, that same reason. There's an element of flexibility to the Odyssey achieved without patch cables that, to me, feels beyond the time. So because of its flexibility, it feels both older and newer than the Mini Minimoog to me. But the price you pay for that flexibility is a little bit of intuitiveness. Part of why the Minimoog is so cool, it's very, very intuitive. I don't think the Odyssey is way worse, but it is a little harder, but it is aided by this signal flow diagram. So here are our oscillators, here's a control section, here's our mixer, our filter, and our VCA. And so if you understand the sound's going to come out here on the back end, just move backwards and make sure you have settings that would be audible at every step of the way. Anyway, if we go left to right, we have two oscillators. We can mix them in this audio mixer here. This is just oscillator one. It can be a sawtooth or pulse. And we have variable pulse width, of course. That can be modulated, so can the pitch, but we'll come back to that later. Oscillator two. Oscillator two has a lot of the same options, also can be synced to oscillator one. Uh, for some really, really crazy effects. We're just going to listen to Oscillator 2 now. Uh, and they have some slightly different options for modulation, which we'll, we'll come back and get to. I'm going to skip over this control section and talk about the filter. 
on the reissue Odyssey, there is this switch for three types because on the original Odyssey, three versions were made with three different filters. I think the Odyssey was made for, I don't, I don't actually know when they stopped making them, several years after its introduction. But there was the first version, which was this sort of whitish faceplate. The second version was black with gold and the colors, and the third version was black with orange, which matches a lot of the other ARP synthesizers that came later than it. Uh, and each of the filters, and I don't think the filters change exactly when the cosmetics change, but I know generally they're associated with each of those models, where there's some rare examples may exist where they don't cross over, but they're represented by a 1, 2, and a 3 here. 2-pole, 12 dB per octave filter for number 1 here. A little more resonance each time. Self-oscillating. Crazy. This second filter is a 4-pole, 24 dB per octave. Let's just go back to two so you can hear the difference. So the slope is steeper on a 4-pole filter. And this filter type 2 is actually based on the Moog ladder filter. Wonderful. And this third type, uh, I know it is the post lawsuit filter because of my buddy Suit and Tie Guy, who has a Eurorack company that sells filters called the post lawsuit filter that are um, that are a modern reproduction in Eurorack of this ARP filter. I think they're so cool. Hi, Suit, if you're watching this. Uh, but this is a different four pole filter. I'm not actually sure how they differ. But I think generally this one is. more stable, perhaps. Ah, I said that, it feels more resonant. Regardless, there are three types of filters to represent what were the three eras of filters available in the original Odyssey. I think that's wonderful. This switch is in addition to the reissues. It's present on all of them. I like the two-pole filter uh, personally the most. Also, this drive switch drives your VCA a little harder. That will affect what we hear from the filter. I find that I like the sound better with it on 100% of the time. Plus, this is a little low output when you use the quarter inch jack. I just don't have good adapters to get XLR from the high output jack into pedals, and I like to use pedals uh, so much. So I end up using the lower output jack, and I need to put a little extra gain into my mixer and things. It's not so low that it is a problem. Um, but I kind of wish the high output, if, if it has to be balanced, put it on a quarter inch as well so I can get it into pedals, no problem. Anyway, that's a minor complaint. And you know, while we're talking about the mixer, we have this third channel here, which can be noise or ring mods. If I turn it up on noise, who could have guessed it's noise? Pink or white from this uh, corner selection here, which is great. I'm pretty sure the original one didn't have this switch as well. I'm not sure about that. Uh, or ring mod, and ring mod is is when oscillators when the oscillators are modulating each other. It'll sound a lot cooler if I take it off sync. So if you have everybody really close and you bring in all three. huge. Now, I know I keep comparing to the mini mode. That's not three oscillators, but it is pretty huge. Totally love that. Having that on a separate channel, that to me is way more valuable than a ring mod that is switched on. 
instead of something that can be mixed in separately. I think that's genius. Then you've got big bass sounds. That's about all I can show you without diving into modulation, which is when things get a little more complicated. So the way the envelope generators work, all the, and this is what I'll point out, the colored keycaps are all to direct you to the different sections. Did you notice we've got green and blue in the mixer to correlate for the green and blue coded oscillators? Isn't that handy? Uh, and red is for our envelope generators. So we have an AR and an ADSR envelope. I like to use the AR to control our VCA, and I like to use the ADSR to control my filter. We can also offset the VCA here just to leave something open all the time. But I'm going to bring modulation almost always for the filter is going to be completely up. And the way AR filters work, you know this, an attack and a release time. And it stays at fully open as long as I hold the key. And then for an ADSR envelope, which we have going to our filter right now. Again, I don't need to go through this. You guys know this. Attack. Attack is how long it takes to get to full. Decay is how long it takes to get to from full to the level set by your sustain. And release is how long it takes to fade to zero after you release a key. So let me speed this up a little bit. That's attack. We're in decay. We're going to stay at our sustain. When I let go, that's our release. Cool. And we can change either the filter or the VCA to be controlled by either the ADSR or the AR. So if I want to use the ADSR for both, or just one switch away. If I want to use the AR for both, we're just one switch away. And I don't want to constantly go back and reference the mini Moog, but just as it's like, you know, relative contemporary. Think about the flexibility in, these are two envelope generators and you can run them both to the same place, to different places, and down here we have other options for the ADSR. We can have it loop like an LFO. And still point it wherever we want, or I can point it somewhere totally else. Like... FM for our second oscillator. And really quickly, <laughs> that's, you know, and I haven't structured this anyway, and I'm worried about jumping ahead to different sections, but I'll, I'll, I think I'll let that lead into our modulation, which will, I'm sure will get complicated fast <laughs> and, and feel disorganized. But part of what I like about the Odyssey is flexibility, and it's really, really easy to see it here in these uh, envelope generators. Okay, we're going to move back to the oscillators, talk a little bit about modulation. So we have, of course, the simple LFO, and mine has been modified. So normally, the LFO would reset on key press, and it would always start, uh, you know, at the beginning of the wave every time you hit a key. I have modified mine to not do that. I tried to modify it in a way that I could switch that behavior on and off. I made a mistake, and I broke a component that I needed. So mine is always a free-running LFO. Normally, they are not. I wish I'd been able to implement on a switch if you want to watch that video. Because you're curious about doing that mod to yours or any version of them, I believe it would be similar or the same on, on the other versions as well. I'll link that for you. It's not my fault if you break anything. <laughs> okay, but we can simply use the LFO to modulate. And again, here's our peach color, right? So this peach colored fader for the LFO relates to all these peach colored caps here. So if you're uh, still learning the synthesizer, where are all these things? Oh, the LFO is peach. Zip right over here. Of course, you can run just your LFO uh, to modulate your pitch and your pulse width here. If I put this on square. Sounds great. And because we have sync on our second oscillator, we can use both of those to get really sort of 
complex wave shapes from our second oscillator. Or, let's say, I want to direct our ADSR to the pitch. Or even without modulation, and we have sync on. We get some irregular waveforms. Textural diversity. I'm going to unsync this. Just a very minor addition that I think would have been really, really nice on the reissue. A three-way switch for octaves on both of these. Yes, I know it's not that hard to pitch them, but I would love to very quickly swap between that. I know that's not the original design, but I think that is a convenience that would have been uh, greatly appreciated on these reissues. Agree or not, and we'll talk more about the reissue thing later, but I would love if these had included uh, octave switches. Okay, those were sort of the simple modulations, and the one you'd expect, pitch and pulse width, for both of these. But if you look down here at these labels, and I'm shooting this in 4K, I'm going to try and blow it up as much as I can. This first peach-colored fader can be the LFO, or it can be the pedal. If you have If you have a pedal, it's the pedal plugged in, or the sample and hold mixer. And so this sample and hold mixer is just right here breaking out before you're actually using the sample and hold circuit it's just the mixer of what's piping in so we can use vco1 to fm vco2 and keep it synced or not keep it sync is very outlandish already. We can use either waveform of VCO1 or the noise generator. Which could be white or pink noise. Doesn't seem to make that much of a difference here. I wonder if it's always the white noise. Anyway, there you go. So the sample and hold mixer, other than the sample and hold, and if you guys are familiar with sample and hold, you might not be familiar with it implemented with a mixer. So normally, we expect it to be just a noise generator, and the sample and hold is triggered by something. Here on the Odyssey, that can be the LFO or the keyboard, when you press the keyboard. And every time you press the keyboard, it samples that value. So whatever that this mixer is at, when you press a key, it holds on to that value. So when you use noise, it, end up, it ends up being random. And so I'm going to trigger it with the LFO, do it relatively fast, and direct that to the pitch here of oscillator 2. You can hear this pitch changing. So just leave the VCA open. And then if I in introduce this output lag, here it's gliding between those values. And I can add more voltage to the mixer with VCO1. If I bring it down to zero, there's nothing to modulate through there. So the sample and hold super, super flexible. If we do it on the keyboard trigger, I'm going to actually get right about where our settings were last time. Every time I press the key, we're at a slightly different pitch. I like that. Maybe not for pitch. It's really, really obvious to hear it on pitch, though. I like it for the filter. Sometimes it almost gives uh, the appearance or the illusion that you have 
uh, velocity as well if you have it tied to the keyboard trigger to the keyboard press so just another way to implement some subtle variation uh, one more time the yellow cap on the sample and hold if I'm like ah, what else can my sample and hold do it can be FM here for oscillator one oscillator two or here on our filter. Great. I think you get the idea of how a lot of modulation works here. So you pick a source with these switches down here and then change its amount with these faders here. The mixer sort of is unique where that in that everything else is modulation. So I think you got an idea, pretty good idea, of the sort of thing you can expect from Yield Odyssey here. So if I just, I'm running an arpeggio on the DeepMind keyboard down here and I'll put on some reverb and delay. Something I find myself doing a lot is leaving sync on for oscillator 2 and modulating it per key press with the sample and hold. Uh, just looking at the panel to see what I missed. You can send the keyboard to the filter. You guys know that. The higher up on the keyboard you get, the brighter the filter gets. We have this whole section. You've seen me playing with transpose this whole time. You guys know what Portamento is going to do. We slide between octaves. Instead of any traditional pitch or mod wheel, which if I use it on my MIDI keyboard down here, which i got to move this drum machine out of the way. Mod wheel doesn't do anything. Plus, we have these PPC proportional pitch controllers. And they're these like pressure sensitive. I have this balancing on my wallet here. So if you squeeze on them, it's a slide down, slide up, or introducing modulation from uh, the LFO. I wish they were a little more sensitive. I feel like I have to press pretty hard to get a reaction. And then within that like grip range, it's 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 pretty hard to be fine about it. So these are cool and like part of the history, and I like that they're there. I would have loved if the mod wheel just did what that does. Uh you can't have it all right with these reissues. So there you go. There's a kind of pretty fast tour. I don't think I have more than another 15 minutes of recording in my in my lungs here. Uh, but I think I've given you some idea of the textural diversity. Why don't I just put on an ARP here? Pretty good. You know, I got to tune back to C here. Cool. Okay, we're tuned back to C. The sort of sound I find myself doing on the Odyssey a lot.
It is just like this. And just to call back to the proportional pitch controllers, I find it so much easier to just have my hand up and use this fader. Then try and carefully get uh, the right pressure there anyway. some of this. Oh, and I guess I didn't show you. You can set VCO1 to be low frequency, but because you've only got a sawtooth and a square, I don't find it super useful for modulation. It can it can certainly be interesting, but I, I find it better for like the sound effecty stuff than any of the sounds I really use this for that often. trying to show you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm thinking again, is there anything I need to show you like mechanically before I talk more hyperbolically? I guess. So another thing, and this will, yeah, I'll, I'll use this to lead in. Um, the Odyssey uh, can be duophonic. At the time, at the time, I imagine that was, at the time that was huge. is the lower note you play goes to oscillator one and the higher note you play goes to VCO two. Super, super cool. I know, like, I don't know totally electrically how it works, but I know it's just math. I know it's like, well, if we can check the voltage or the resistance, perhaps, I believe, on either end of this voltage divider, which is the keyboard, you can do some math to figure out which two notes are being pressed. Really cool. So it was really a clever innovation more than it was a new technological advancement, I think, which is all, all, all the more reason to be excited about it. Anyway, that leads into one of my complaints about the way the reissue was was chosen to work. I would love a three-way switch here on the back anywhere that let me decide low note priority, last note priority, or high note priority, and a separate switch to turn on duophony, to turn duophony on or off. It could have even been one of these pinprick switches, like the mode here for portamento on transpose, which is like which is like a okay, we'll implement the way it used to work instead of adding like some some modernization feature. Because if if the duophonic thing was separate and we had a way to control our note priority, that would save us a lot of trouble. So for example, if I just have oscillator one, it's always low note priority because of the way it works with the duophonic parts. And so I can't, uh, I can't play the way I'm really used to playing on a modern keyboard. And that's not a complaint with regards to me and my playing experience. That's just the way keyboards work nowadays. They are last note priority. That's the most intuitive thing to us. And if I swap to oscillator 2... Oh, and I've got... Uh, uh, let me turn off sample and hold. Let me turn off everything to the filter. Uh, and here, with all the modulation off now, uh, with VCO2, it's high note priority. So... I, I have respect that that's the way it used to work, but that's not the way modern synthesizers work. We have options to, to get around that. You can, in the patch bay on the back, I have really tiny cables that work great for it, but if you patch the CV out to the CV in, you can defeat that duophony, uh, but then you're always low note priority. 
it's nice to have some consistency in that behavior and you're not accidentally playing two notes at the same time, which definitely happens. But you, you heard what I'm saying. I just wish that was uh, one of those things that became a modern convenience. How hard would it have been to implement that into this circuit? I, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I, I don't think it would have been that bad. And would I have been pissed off about a few switches on the back? No, I wouldn't have been. So that leads into the sort of uh, you know, what parts of the original are essential to the experience and, and when is it not a reissue anymore and all those things. So, uh, so sort of like modernization features, like I was talking about, it's weird when there's some of them, but not more, you know what I mean? So is part of the original soul, so to speak, the original essence of what makes the Odyssey, the Odyssey, uh, that sort of quirk because the keyboard is duophonic, you get this behavior of low or high note priority differently depending on which oscillator you have up. No, I don't think that's essential to the experience of the Odyssey. And I think a lot of people would agree. So that's the sort of thing I like to see as a modernization feature in reissue, along with MIDI, which is here. Velocity would have been nice, but I, I think that might have changed the panel or might have needed to change the panel in a way that might go against the original vision of this. So that I understand. Put it on the back, perhaps. Aftertouch as well, even as just jacks on the back. Because I know there's a MIDI to CV converter in here. Why can't we get velocity and aftertouch pulled out of this to, you know, just run into to just run into the CV jacks on the back? So, you know, is that too many asks? I don't really know. And you think about the other like very, very similar, you know, sort of reissues and you get the new version of the Prophet 5, which has velocity and aftertouch and, and some menu settings for things like no priority. Yes, that's a different tier of product. Yes, polyphonic instruments get a little more leeway in, in benefiting from things like velocity and aftertouch. Uh, but I digress. I, I think the modernization features that are on this are nice. I would have liked to see a few more. Now, just like sort of big time theoretical, the idea that something that was produced 50 years ago, oh my God, is that right? I, I love the idea that in music, a reissue of something almost exactly as it was in 1972, 1970, whatever, can still be relevant to us today and is still a viable product for a company to make. And it's still an exciting thing for me, somebody born 1995, to buy and use and talk about. I think it's so cool. Look at guitars, look at guitar pedals, but also synthesizers, really specifically synthesizers for me. How cool is it that the one of the earliest, like, you know, four stage musicians instruments is still useful for stage musicians years and years and years later? And that is really the main reason why I have this and why I love it. It represents a history to me. It represents the beginning of, I could just reach around, all these modern things that I love and appreciate so much. And to have it in a state that is modern enough for me to use, but vintage enough to have the flair and the feel and the functionality of something that, uh, you know, I, I think of Herbie Hancock associated with this. I think of the back of, is it Sunlight? Is that the name of the record? Where on the insert, and I, I hope I can find it online, I, I think I have a copy of it too. And on the insert, when you pull it out, which, I, you know what, I'm even going to grab mine and pull it out. It's an outline of, of all the keyboards that he was using, and there's an Arp Odyssey and a, and a mini Moog. So musicians I look up to in music that to me represents this early era of synthesizers being accepted and, and incorporated into popular music is still, I can buy the same thing and I can use the same thing in my music and, and, and have it and own it and all that stuff. So I could go on about that for a while. I think you really get my impression of that. It's very cool to me that a five decade old design is still valuable and useful, and we can buy a modern one that isn't going to break. We don't have to take to a tech with the conveniences of MIDI, the conveniences of a version uh, that's just specifically for desktop. All that stuff is, is so exciting and, and part of, and, and really part of why I love uh, what I'm able to talk about because it seems so uniquely positioned. The idea of designing a product for art and, and what that looks like over the years and, and how that does and doesn't change, I just think is so fascinating. So uh, as far as like which one to buy, which one of these versions, I think if you really need full size keys, don't buy one of the full size ones. Those come at a dramatic premium. Uh, get one of the desktop ones. If you don't take care about the faceplate color, I think there's the most of the black and orange, the revision three, and just plug a full size keyboard with MIDI into it, preferably one with a sequencer. And then you've got all sorts of modern functionality. If you like the idea of having it for stage and having it all together, uh, the slim key is so much less expensive than the full size ones, especially considering how expensive the kit they just announced is. I don't really see any reason unless you really specifically want a complete package that is just like the way they were 
when they were released. And if you know that's what you want, you know that's what you want, and you wouldn't consider any other version. So I think the desktop is by far the best deal, and there's a chance you've already got a MIDI keyboard to plug into it. And I think that's a knee high hurdle to get over using a MIDI cable to control this. And just another plus the way you decide the MIDI channel on this, there's uh, like a dip switch. You set it, it's not exactly like a binary. It's kind of close, but you just look in the manual. Okay, I need to get this on seven. What switches need to be up for it to be seven? Click it in and then it's really set it and forget it. That is a modernization and an implementation of this that doesn't include a menu or any software editor and you can edit that digital parameter. That is exactly the way I want a reissue to be done. But yes, like I said, if you want one of these, look used, look used on Reverb with my affiliate link. I think the desktop is the best version. I don't think there's many of the Rev1 faceplates out there anymore. They're pretty desirable. I think this one's the coolest. I like gray. But uh, there you go. The r is something I've had for three-ish years. I really do love it. I love the way it looks, the way it sounds, the sort of sounds it's capable of producing. Really appreciate you watching. You'll see this uh, go up while I'm uh, flying through the air on my way to New Zealand. <laughs> appreciate you watching. Uh, my name's Jorb. I love gear that really includes the Odyssey. Cheers. And so long.